The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Next on the Bronx Journal, urban farmer Karen Washington. Dean IC will be rapping about education, second chance animal rescue, and La Casse Grande cigars. This is the Bronx Journal, the television edition of the online multilingual community newspaper. Published by the students and faculty of the Journalism, Communication, and Theater Department at Lehman College. On the internet, on the radio, and on television, the Bronx Journal covers the issues concerning the people of the Bronx. Hello and welcome to the Bronx Journal. I am Christian Santana. The Bronx has always been home to more green spaces in New York City than any other borough, though it has not always had the greenest of food options. Urban farming is changing that by bringing healthy, social, and economic benefits along with it. Karen Washington, who has been farming for nearly 30 years now, is here today to talk about the urban farming and its relationship with our community. Ms. Washington, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So for someone who doesn't know about urban farming, uh, maybe in a nutshell, could you explain it? Well, urban farming is growing food in cities, and it's something that's not new. A lot of people think it's a new thing, but people have been growing food back since the early 1800s, uh, first starting with school gardens, and then we had the Victory Gardens in World War I and World War II. And so now we have over 600 community gardens citywide. Okay, and how did, how did you get involved with it? Well, I got involved like most people back in the uh, early 70s and late 80s when the city was going through a financial crisis. At one time, New York City alone had over 15,000 vacant lots. Can you imagine 15,000 vacant lots, mostly in low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color? That means Brooklyn, Harlem, and of course the Bronx. And so outside my, my, my window, I happened to see this empty lot that had been there for over three years. I saw a person with a shovel and a pick and I went up to him and I said, so what are you doing? And he said, I want to start a community garden. And so with the help of the community, started the Garden of Happiness. Okay. And um, is, is that a project that you do on your own or is that something that, um, that's funded by the city? Well, they call them community gardens because it's the sweat equity of communities. Right. The land is leased from the city, but you need at least 10 people, 10 members within a community to help start a community garden or an urban farm. Okay. Um, so what do you like most about it? Is it? Well, what I like about growing food in the, in the city, first of all, gardening per se, is the fact that you're outdoors. You're outdoors, you're one with nature, uh, there's community, so you learn different sort of languages and different tastes, and then you, you know, just sit back and, and have a place for our seniors and have a place for, for children. I like it because it's a way to just get away and relax. So it's more than just the farm, you would say? It, it Definitely, it's more than just a farm. It's a, I, I say it's like a community resource center right. because not only are you growing food, but you're also learning about social issues that are happening around the community. Right, it's like one of those community centers that nobody goes to, but in this case, everyone goes to it because it's outside. Yes, definitely <laughs> when food is involved. <laughs> so what's, what's changed about it um, and, and since the beginning till now? Well, I think because in the very beginning, it was more so of people taking back their neighborhoods because of blight. And um, it was for beautification because, you know, we, if you're around an empty lot with a lot of garbage and debris, it makes the community look bad. And so I think the first element of community garden with gardening was for beautification. But I think that as beautification, the transition started to, to form around food and health, people started growing food. The emphasis now is really on growing food and getting people to understand exactly where their food comes from. So I see now the transition is from food and that relationship food has to health. Okay, and um, what, what keeps you going personally in, in you know, relation to this topic? 
Um, I love I love being outdoors. I love communities. I love growing food. Once you grow something and you taste it, it totally blows you blows your way. And so I like to have that advantage of going out in the open air and and being around people and growing my own food and then sitting down and having a meal with it with family and friends. Yeah, I imagine you know, it's the it's the literal fruit of your labors. The um, fruit of my labors. Yeah, um, so how, how's the community responded? You know, you're, you're a Bronxite, so I imagine you, everyone you work with, not everyone you work with, but the majority of people you work with are from the Bronx. Definitely. I think that it really has changed the whole gamut of the food system. The fact that these parcels of land are given to us by the city. We're leased, four-year lease from the city. And so what we do is put sweat equity. I mean, we, we do get free water, which is really good from the city as well. But the majority of, of, of the work that's in community gardens are done by, by community people. And so people bring their own sort of spin and ethnicity uh, to a garden and their own culture and tradition, which is really, really important. So when I first started, my community garden was mostly African-American and Latino. And as they moved on, and now we have a, a huge population of Mex Mexicans. So I know all about Papalo, Papiche, Tomatillos. So, um... <laughs> What, what else are you involved in uh, with uh, in, in regards to urban farming? Well, the thing I'm also involved in looking at social issues that affect uh, that affect my community. You know, you hear about the the negativity that the Bronx has when it comes to health and nutrition. We know all that. We know that um, basically we're one of the poorest um, districts, congressional districts in the country. Um, when it comes to poverty and hunger. However, I want to sort of focus on the assets that we have, and the assets are these community gardens, and the fact that there are people out there that are trying to change the, the face of the Bronx, um, that growing is good, that uh, we have over 160 community gardens and school gardens in the Bronx, and that there are people who are actively involved in changing the narrative of what the Bronx is all about. Um, so, so what are the biggest challenges you find um, with changing those narratives? Well, the thing is, is that, first of all, um, is really giving this sort of negative appearance that Bron the Bronx has and really changing it in, in terms that there are people who are out there trying to, to grow food. There are people who are trying to find healthy options when it comes to, to eating, that um, we, are, we have farmers markets that are out there down in the Bronx that are, are delivering healthy food choices in neighborhoods. Um, again, we have our community gardens and urban and farms which are open to the public where people can come in and learn how to grow food. We have a strong initiative school garden program where now the curriculum is really focusing on agriculture. And then we have, which I see is school children learning how to grow food and understand exactly where their food comes from, which is paramount. So h how young is that? Is that like at an elementary level? Even? Elementary school. I have a, a friend, Jason uh, Gottlowitz, I, I hope I give me that little plug, who is doing a excellent, excellent work um, at PS211 and uh, is really and is really working on his own. He's not getting paid for it. He's a he's a regular teacher, but he understands the emphasis of really getting kids at an early age from kindergarten up until fourth grade, really getting them involved, getting them out into the open and, and uh, having them understand exactly where their food comes from. OK, um, so who are your biggest supporters? Um, is anybody uh, in the community or? Um well, the first lady, I would first say. Lady, yeah. The first lady, definitely. But we have our politicians have been very, very supportive. Uh, Congressman Serrano has been very supportive. Uh, um, our past um, our president has been very supportive. We're doing a Bronx trolley tour, which will give people a chance to go and visit the community gardens and urban farms in, in the Bronx. Our local council people have been very, very involved. Um, Joel Rivera, when he was a council person, was, was very involved. And now we're trying to get um, Richie Torres on board, as well as our new council person involved. And of course, our Senator Gustavo Rivera, please, uh, he would kill me if I didn't mention yeah, definitely. his um, name, because he has a healthy uh, option pl platform. OK. Uh, so what do you see as the future um, for these platforms and urban farming in general? Well, I think that as um, as people understand the relationship to food and health, I think that more people will uh, get a chance to, number one, ask questions, ask exactly where does that food come from? Um, who is the farmer? Who is the person that grew that food? Getting people to read labels. If you can't pronounce it, you shouldn't be eating it. Um, having people understand that what um, high 
um, fructose corn syrup is and, 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 and that relationship it has to diabetes, how when you see something that says um, sodium, that it's salt and has that, have that relationship to hypertension. And so I think that people are going to start asking questions and also are going to demand better food options as well as healthy food choices. Right. Um, so would you say that's one of your goals? That's one of my goals. I'm about to retire in a couple, and well, four weeks from now. And so my emphasis is to really work to eradicate hunger and poverty. It's a big, 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 big order. But, you know, if I can make a difference in one person's life to change the dynamics, the way they think about food, then I think I've done my job. Okay. Uh, so, you know, career-wise, what would you say is your biggest achievement? Well, uh, being a mother. Yeah. <laughs> being one well, career-wise, I think that I've been a physical therapist for 37 and a half years, which is a job that I love. The fact that I'm helping people to restore function, I think that's very, very, very good. I'm proud of that. But I'm also proud that I've been an urban farmer for over 27 years and really um, getting my hands in the soil, but also really understanding the dynamics of the, of the food system as a whole and looking at the haves and have nots and where we have to go to make sure that this food system is fair, equitable, and safe. Definitely. Um, um, you, you've been recognized actually um, not only by the Senate, but the White House for your actions. Um. Yeah, so along with the uh, New York Botanical Gardens was able to meet uh, the First Lady back in 2010 when the New York Botanical Gardens was um, given an award for the work that they have been doing and I was asked as part of, as a the community person li liaison to accept that award as well. So it was really, really good to go to the White House. I think that was one of the high points in my life uh, to meet the First Lady. Um, so how would someone get involved with uh, any of your projects? Well, this is the time I think people are now cabin, have cabin fever because we have so much snow. Definitely. But spring is right around the corner and so these community gardens and urban farms are open to the public. And usually around April or May, that's when people's juices are gonna start flowing. They can come to any community garden and ask if there are plots available. Um, in my particular community garden, we have over 30 families. And so what we usually do is wait for those who had farmed last year to come back. And if there's empty beds, first come, first serve, you can come in and you can and get a bed. But you don't have to be from that neighborhood. You don't have to be from that okay. neighborhood. You just okay. have to have the ambition to be there in July and August when it's hot to take care of your plot. Okay. Just to end, uh, is there anywhere someone could contact you or any of your organizations? Yeah, so um, we have a website, lafamiliaverde.org, L-A-F-A-M-I-L-I-A-V-E-R-D-E.org, or you can contact the New York City Community Garden Coalition, NYCCGC.org, or you can um, look at Green Thumb. Green Thumb is a city agency that will provide you leases for, uh, to start a garden. Okay. Thank you again, Ms. Washington, for coming on the show. We'll be back in a few moments with more of the Bronx Journal. When I have an asthma attack, I feel scared. Sometimes my parents have to take me to the hospital. I feel like a fish with no water. You know how to react to their asthma attacks. Here's how to prevent them. Call 1-866-NO-ATTACKS. Visit www.noattacks.org or call your doctor. Because even one attack is one too many. My name's Brandon. Nine years old being alcoholic. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Brandon. I'll start drinking with the older kids. And whatever they do, I'll do. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. So start talking before they start drinking. I know I'll start with alcohol. I'm just not sure how it's gonna end. Welcome back to the Bronx Journal. I'm Rosa Elena Oliveras. Joining us is Ian Willie. He's the Dean of Kip Washington Heights Middle School and also a rapper. Both as an educator and his performing identity, I see Will, he's working to make a difference for both teachers and students within the New York City school system. He's also working on an album and has been getting attention in education blogs after the release of his music video, Board of Education. Thank you for joining us, I see Will. 
Thank you for having me here. So what is your opinion on the New York State education system as of right now? I think in education right now we have uh, a whole lot of amazing people uh, and a lot of teachers that care, a lot of families that obviously care, and kids that want to grow. And I think that we have a lot of environments and a structure where that is uh, not fostering the growth that we want to foster for a lot of people. I think that there's a lot of potential that's just left untapped and kids that want to grow and, and become something and follow some dream and, uh, and a lot of challenges in, in the way to getting there. What type of changes are you looking for? So without getting too deep into education policy right now, I think that the biggest changes that I'm looking for is, is what any teacher wants uh, for their student, which is that they feel empowered, that they feel uh, like they have uh, the potential to reach for some dream. Um, and I think that that is being shut down a lot, um, not because of any one person's uh, what, what they're what they're doing, but just as a systematic uh, issue in, in New York and then across the country. Um, yeah, so I, I think that the, the biggest change uh, to speak in, a, in that big sense is that um, it's to support kids in, in following those dreams. Do you feel like you're reaching people with the message you're trying to bring out? The music video has been really exciting to me. Um, and I've always had a passion for uh, issues of justice um, and uh, the music video was a uh, very a challenge and uh, it came at the end of a long journey uh, or in the middle of a journey I should say um, and I think a lot of people have reached out to me after seeing that and you know some people enjoy I mean the kids are amazing uh, as actors and as dancers um, People have enjoyed the hip-hop aspect and people have enjoyed the humor that comes throughout the video. But what people have consistently said uh, across the map is that they, they appreciate the message that it's giving. And that was something that I didn't know. I was like, is this going to be too controversial for, for different people, especially in our times now? Because there is a lot of controversy around education. But I think that there's a general understanding that our schools are not where they need to be yet across this country. And because of that general understanding, people were into it. People were into the message. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was good to hear, it was good to hear their response and I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing to, to build from that and grow from that. So what goes into, what thoughts go through your mind when you're writing a song? Uh, I love this question because I was a writing teacher for four years. Uh, so I think a lot about the writing process, uh, and for me, every every song is different. Um, first, I'll take a beat, um, and I'll listen to it in my I, iPhone for the two, three weeks, and just listen to it and vibe with it and kind of just dream to it and think very big picture. I'll, I'll brainstorm for a long time until I know like what the basic uh, thing that I want to get at with the song is, and then... I'll sit down and without thinking too much about the rhymes or about the flow yet, I'll just write down, here's exactly what I want to say. Um, because that's important to me. Like the actual message, the thing that I, in particular, it's coming from me, um, want to say. And once I get that down, then I will, uh, then I'll, I'll revise it and revise until I get the flow exactly how I want, until I get the rhymes exactly how I want them, until every word, I'm, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. Uh, and, and so that's basically the, the process. So speaking of songs, one of your songs, Board of Education, is spelled B-O-R-E-D. Can you tell us the message behind that? So I think the message behind the song is, uh, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, right? It's a little bit sim simplistic, um, and it, it's supposed to be. I think back to, to my own education uh, when I think of this song a lot. And it's crazy now for me to think about it. I love to read nowadays. I love to learn. I love to study and had a great time in college with that. But that wasn't the case for me up until late high school. And um, 
And you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I had a great teacher uh, in my junior year history class in high school. And his name was Mr. Hemaseth. Shout out to Mr. Hemaseth. And he, um, he would just create these enormous controversies in the class. He would uh, spit off some facts and, and tell you this historical uh, perspective and say, you know, and that's why the Jews are responsible for the Holocaust. And the class would be up in arms. You know, everyone would be like, what? What are you talking about? But he used to tell me, and he knew, he knew what teachers were teaching and what weren't. And so he would say, hey, Ian, don't, don't go to that math class. He was an old grouchy man, really cool. He's like, don't go to that math class. Take this history book. Get in the book room right there. He'd like put me in the closet, basically. He'd say, read that book. Read for the next, you know, read two chapters of that book. And that was when I started to become really interesting. I mean, he took an interest in me, which was important. Uh, for me, and then he made it, he, he, he looked at what I was interested in and made it relevant for where I was uh, in my life. And so I don't think that that is always the case. I think that we struggle, and as a teacher, I know how hard it can be to, to connect with uh, all of your students and to find a thing that's, that's relevant for them. But as we continue to push forward and, and make it engaging for kids, uh, I think that they will feel con increasingly empowered um, to learn and to, to have fun with it and to make it relevant for them. So that's bored. <laughs> Long answer. Uh, no, it's a great message you're sending to the kids. Um, so you focus on education in this album. Is there other issues you want to focus on in future albums that you would like to work on? So I don't just focus uh, on education for this album. I think that you know, I don't want to be the education rapper. Yes, I'm a teacher. Yes, I spend most of my days teaching. Um, and so that's a distinct part of who I am. But that would be cheesy. Uh, I want to be Ian, or I see Will, the guy who um, has the privilege of working with kids and pushing them to reach their own dreams. And so... I'm pushing myself to be doing the same, remodeling the same, and empowering myself, growing myself while I'm pushing kids to, to grow. So anything that fits within that growth idea for me is, is fair game. Like That's what you'll hear throughout my album. So there's a song that's about, uh, about the environment, um, and there are songs that are about political corruption. Um, get at those topics but at the end of the day I think what you'll hear consistently throughout is this idea of empowerment so how do you plan on promoting this album that's what I came to you guys for <laughs> <laughs> uh, no I've, I've, I've put together a band so I'm really excited to have a show tomorrow night um, in the city um, There's a couple other videos that we're, we're talking about. I'm talking with the same director who, who made that incredible video um, about the next one. And yeah, just, just trying to get out there and connect with people. Um, that's, that, that's where I am so far. If you have any ideas, that would be very helpful though. I'm all so fine. how does your occupation as the dean of a school affect your music? It means that I have a lot less time for it. Uh, I think I, I think that uh, the kids are every day they're motivating for me every day the kids are inspiring for me so even though I have a very limited time you know I'm at school for 11 hours on a regular basis of the day so there's not a lot of time for the music but I think that it's made up for um, and that I'm very inspired uh, and that I have a lot of thoughts every day is a new adventure. I get to deal uh, with uh, 200 little amazing young people with their own feelings and their own desires and dreams. And uh, so yeah, that, that, that affects, that gives me a lot of inspiration. Today I was in, the, in, in my office um, with a student who uh, is an amazing dude, and I didn't even know he was into this, but he's, you know, he's seen the video, of course, and watched it a, a bunch of times, and um, 
never told me that he was really into rapping, that, that he had started to write his own songs. Um, and so, you know, I pushed him and he, he did a, a little performance for me in the office. And, uh, um, yeah. Okay, so would you perform real quick an acapella of one of your songs? Yeah. So the song is called Five in the Air. Five in the air. Cause everybody in the building is building at night. You can feel the vibe in the air. It can't be wrong when it's feeling so right. You know the world gonna feel it when they play this one. War three with lasers, no blades of guns. So pick your head up, baby face the sun, and put your fingers up the shoulder for the place you're from. Now put them up for the place you is. I fail chemistry, I'm no physicist. The only thing I know about energy is it exists. Bring it to a party when you raise your fist. When the bass is blasting, don't matter where you at. Basement, rooftop, BX of Manhattan. Down southwest coast, any place on the map, long as you got your hands up, then you know what's happening, K Pasta Man. They got tricked that I was talking about the schools, still look at the kids. An extraordinary metaphor to stir up endorphins, endorsing this enormous universe metamorphosis. So, would you please give us your contact information for anybody who wants to do any bookings or shows with you? Uh, yeah, you can reach me through my website at icwill.com. Thank you so much for joining us for the Bronx Journal. Absolutely. Thanks for coming, and we'll be back with more of the Bronx Journal. So, how'd it go? So, it was very good. Is this where we talk in, like, the camera? lose their babies to gun crimes. You'll always be your mother's baby. So before you commit a gun crime, think about who you'll leave behind. Gun crimes hit home. Hi, and welcome to the Bronx Journal. I am Gabriel Salcedo. When most of us think of animals, we think of happy pets in a nice, loving home with an owner. Sadly, for many animals, this is just a dream. It can happen for many reasons, including animal abuse, abandonment, or perhaps a family simply can't afford to keep a pet. Here to discuss the problems many animals face in the city, here is Jennifer Brooks, the president of Second Chance Rescue. Thank you for joining us today, Jennifer. Thank you, Gabriel, for having us. So uh, for everybody that uh, doesn't know about Second Chance Rescue, can you uh, tell us what exactly do you guys do? Sure. Um, we are a large nonprofit organization. Um, we rescue animals that are in high kill animal shelters in New York City. Um, we take in owner surrenders from people who have to leave their home or get evictions uh, or can no longer care for a pet. We also provide outreach programs for people who are low, f low economically funded, and we also try to help stray animals on the street. All right, and, um, and how, how did you uh, start this group, and when? Um, I started Second Chance in 2009 after visiting uh, New York City Animal Care and Control, which is um, the largest kill shelter in New York. Um, I had no idea that animals were killed every single day in New York City. And when I went there and saw the animals, I had to do something to help them. Yeah, I was going to say, um, on a personal level, that must, uh, that must be pretty tough to hear all the stories or even see uh, many injured animals. Uh, did you find it hard to, to get used to that? Uh, in the beginning, it was definitely hard to see animals abused and, you know, almost near death. Um, but as you go, time, you know, more time passes, you kind of become hardened to the reality of the abuse and the state of the animal sometimes. And uh, the majority of, your, of the animals that you rescue, do uh, you think they're, they're abandoned or they were animals that um, are in a shelter that was full and they had to get rid of them or? Well, for animals end up at kill shelters for a variety of reasons. You know, people no longer have the money. 
Um, the New York City Animal Care and Control, which is the municipal city shelter, they are mandated by law to take in any animal that comes through the door. So they cannot say no. They're an open admission shelter. They get full, you know, they fill up very quickly. Um, that's why every single day there's a euthanization list for dogs and for cats. On average, it could be anywhere from 20 to 30 dogs a day and anywhere from 20 to 50 cats are also euthanized because of lack of homes. Oh. And uh, would you say there's more uh, animals, I mean, is there more dogs or, or cats that are, that are uh, being rescued? Um, it's both. You know, there's a huge feral cat problem here in New York City and well, in the five boroughs, especially in the Bronx. Um, and there's a lot of people out there, you know, doing the wrong thing, breeding dogs, you know, everybody's, the economy isn't good and thinking of quick ways to make money, <laughs> but they're not actually thinking about the animals that are going to pay the price for that. And uh, do, do you, um, is there any cases, like, do you see that uh, animals, uh, they get let go by the owner just because the, the owner just can't afford it, they can't oh. afford to keep the keep the pet anymore? Like, does that happen often? It does happen very often, um, especially for medical reasons. Um, a lot of people can't afford vet care and if an emergency happens and those animals also get surrendered to the city shelter. Um, we are one of the largest rescue organizations in New York City and we get most of the emergency phone calls for the medical cases as well. So we take most of the abuse cases and animals that have to be rushed immediately to emergency hospitals. So. It's a combination, you know, with the, with, with the money, you know. Um, there needs to be more options for people out there in New York City, and there's not. Okay, and uh, the adoption process, like, uh, when you guys have an animal and then uh, somebody comes and they want to adopt it, uh, how do you guys go about that process? Yeah, we advertise our animals a variety of ways uh, through social media, a website, um, and when people come to us to adopt, they have to fill out an application, they have to go through a screening process. Um, you know, we also want to make sure it's the right animal for that specific home, you know, as far as breed and energetic energy level. Uh, so we try to do that. And then um, the last step is going and visiting their home and making sure that it's a safe environment for the animal. You know, has, has there been uh, times when, when you went to the, to the home and realized that the person wasn't a good fit or? Oh uh, sure, yeah, you know, sometimes, uh, well that's another reason why there's so many animals in the shelter, you know, people think, oh it's going to be an easy job, it's a cute puppy, <laughs> you know, that only lasts so long when the novelty wears off, out goes the dog, you know, out to the shelter. So we also try to educate people um, about training and about, you know, keeping your animal spay and neutered, keeping it healthy. So we try to um, prevent those, you know, a lot of mishaps from happening so that they can actually keep the animal in the home. And uh, you, you, uh, you specialize in uh, pit bulls. Can, can you tell us more a little bit about pit bulls and how come they have the bad reputation and how come uh, things may be harder for them than for another kind of breed? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, New York City, 85% of the animals that are in kill shelters, that the dogs, are pit bulls. Um, they've, they're a very misunderstood breed. Uh, the media loves to sensationalize all of the bad, the pit bull bites, and you know, you never hear about the golden retriever who bites. Um, but I think that the image of the pit bull is getting better, um, and we try to promote responsible ownership of pit bulls. Um, we try to, you know, do positive things for pit bull owners, you know, weight contests and, you know, things like that. So, um, yeah, we're really trying to, you know, make families realize that a pit bull is a family dog. They were actually made to watch over children in England. That was what mm. the breed was oh, originated wow. for, and a lot of people don't know that. They're great with children, you know. And again, it comes with, you know, proper and responsible ownership and not abusing the animal and, you know, socializing it and making it friendly with everybody. Well, I, I definitely didn't know that. And uh, speaking of pit bulls, uh, we have one right here, <laughs> uh, which is, you said it was rescued in the Bronx? Yes. Um, Lexus is actually Second Chance Rescue's first rescue oh. dog ever, um, first pit bull. <laughs> Um, back in 2007, um, she was rescued. She was a six-month-old puppy that was running around loose on the streets of the Bronx. 
um, and she was picked up by the New York City Police Department and brought down to Manhattan's Animal Care and Control Shelter. And she was rescued by an organization like my organization, Another Rescue. And that's actually how I became involved in, I went to the kill shelter and it really opened my eyes, you know, to, to these dogs that needed our help. So much that you have four pit bulls, right? Yes, <laughs> can't just, they're like potato chips, you can't just <laughs> have one. Um, but now I have four and um, they all were rescued when I first started Second Chance. So they're all getting up there in age. And, um, but they're all, they're all breed ambassadors. They're friendly, they love children. One of my other dogs goes to um, school and reads mm -hmm. with um, with somebody for the kids, and so I try to promote, you know, responsible pet ownership and try to get the pit bull, you know, the name that it, it deserves. That's good. That's real good. It's, it's true that our pit bulls get a real bad reputation, and it's it's a shame because yeah. they're they're really not, you know, as violent and as bad as people uh, oh. make them make them out to be. Absolutely. They're very sweet, and a lot of studies have been done. Statistically, you are more likely to get bit by a lab or a golden retriever than you are from a pit bull. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I didn't know that either. <laughs> yeah. And um, in the Bronx specifically, has there been any uh, animal issues in the Bronx that you, that you could tell us about? Yes. Um, the Bronx is a big area for um, pit bull breeding. Um, also, pit bull fighting as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, people, you know, breeding, trying to sell puppies and, you know, a, a lot of abandonment. Um, we went to an apartment building where they were keeping four or five pit bulls on the roof of the building. This was in the summer in crates. No food, no water. Uh, we were able to purchase, you know, I mean, you do what you have to do for the animal, you know, if you, here's 50 bucks, here's 100 bucks, you know, all right, take the dog, you know. So sometimes you have to play the game um, for the animal's sake. Mm -hmm. But we were able to get two of those dogs and place them in loving homes with families, and they, they're doing great today. That's good. It's, so. it's crazy how some people could just think of something like that to put an animal in yep. the roof in the crate. And uh, for anybody that's interested in uh, volunteering mm -hmm. or uh, donating, uh, how, how would they go about that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we always, you know, we run on donations. That's how we operate, just from the general public. Um, they can go to our website, which is www.nycsecondchancerescue.org. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It was thank a pleasure you. talking to you. And uh, we'll be back with more of the Bronx Journal. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Sir, are you okay? What? Oh, this? It's probably nothing. I'm sure it'll go away. Go away? But, sir, that can't be good. No, it's cool. Really. Do you want a napkin or something? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this. So why ignore the signs of a stroke? At the first warning signs, call 911 immediately. Because time lost is brain lost. I think it breaks a little to the left. Uh-uh. To the right. Nope. Straight. I told you it was going right. For fun playtime ideas, go online. Just don't stay long. Hello, I'm Donnie Jackson, and welcome back to the Bronx Journal. A connoisseur is a person who, through study and interest, has a fine appreciation for something. Some like to purchase art, high-end automobiles, or other collectibles. Others buy only the finest wines so that they can pour, swirl, smell, and sip just to make sure they have the best year of Chardonnay. Like these other things, cigars have been around for hundreds of years as social functions, celebrations, and at times, cigars represent a certain level of success. Paul De Silvio, also known as Paulie Cigars, and the Cigar Czar, is here from La Casa Grande Cigars in the Bronx. He will give us a look into the world of cigars. Paulie, welcome. Well, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. So, Paulie, please, tell me, what made you come up with the name La Casa de Grande Cigars? 
Well, you know, growing up in the Bronx, I had a pretty rough background. So to keep me out of the big house, I call it the big house. In Spanish and Italian, La Casa Grande means a big house. I looked it up 20 years ago, nobody had it. So we stuck with it. Nice. <laughs> so what made you get into cigars? Well, I smoke cigars. I, don't, I never smoked anything else, cigarettes or anything else like that. So mm -hmm. I got into the hobby of smoking cigars 25 years ago. I basically saw there was no stores in the Bronx, like really high-end cigars in the Bronx. So I thought I'd bring that culture to Arthur Avenue, Little Italy, where um, everything's fresh, handmade, foods are fresh, and it just goes hand-in-hand -hand with tradition. Mm. So we just did hand-rolled cigars, and it just blew up, kind of got big overnight. So how long have you been in the business of actual cigar making, or was it just everything together at once? Like nah, I, I started the first couple of years getting well-named brands like Cohibas, Monte Cristos and stuff, selling mm -hmm. those out of the store. And I just got bored with that, so I figured I'd just make my own brand. Travel to Nicaragua, Honduras, Santo Domingo, and figure out how to make my own cigar, my own brand, blend that brought a whole team of cigar rollers over. And that's how, that's how we got uh, going back in the day. How did you get your team of cigar rollers? Did you like send out an email to find somebody? You have like tryouts? What did you do for it? Yeah, we did like uh, Dominican Idol. Like they all got up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> nah, we, <laughs> we just, most of my, they all come from one town in, in DR, most of them, because mm -hmm. they're very close with each other. Right. It's kind of like word of mouth. Um, a lot of them haven't been, back in 20 years ago, a lot of them didn't come to the States that much. So when there was an interest, one brought three, three brought five. Mm. And it's kind of like coming to the country to actually do a God-given craft rather than just do whatever you can get. You know, they do what they love to do. Mm -hmm. So they're not really workers. They're kind of artists. People come from all over the country, all over the world to see them perform their art of hand-rolled cigars. Right. And so were they already made in terms of a career out there, or was it something that was just they built up? What do you mean? In terms of their career, was it, did you look for people specifically that already yeah, had... Yeah, they have to be there for years doing that. They have factories be. out in Dominican that make name brand cigars. They have to know what they're doing, you know, at least 15 years doing it, oh, okay. you know, the 10 years. And they have a school out there that teaches those kind of okay. trades. And so do you uh, guys look specifically at that school for people? You actually, I was lucky. I found one main supervisor for a huge factory and we became close uh -huh. and we just build a relationship from there and here we are all the years later nice nice so what is it actually that makes a cigar special it's definitely the farming it starts with a little seed you know kind of like coffee and everything else that you know it's also like wine like you were saying before fine wine it comes with age tobacco aging process in rooms maybe you know, with cedar walls, uh, tobacco picks up characteristics over the year of of the d different vegetation that may be around it while it's growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to have a good crop. You have to know what you're doing, how to farm. It all starts there, how you store it, who's rolling it. And um, after you make it, the final, and you'll see it being demonstrated, the final, you know, finished product, we put that away in an aging room. So it's it's a long journey for a cigar. <laughs> it could be like two years waiting. So it's a lot to get that smoked. yeah, it's not it's just a lot that separates it from other brands, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, yes. Well, no. Well, I mean, most name brands do that. Mm -hmm. Famous name brands, mm -hmm. and that's what we aim to do: to age cigars, kind of like do a boutique cigar, mm -hmm. and that represents the Bronx, represents us. I pretty much represent New York when it comes to cigars. Okay. Um, do you find that cigars are not for everyone? Uh, of course, yeah. It's it, actually more and more women really are smoking cigars a lot. A lot of my clientele used to be like ninety ten. Now it's like maybe you know sixty forty when it comes to females smoking cigars. If you go to lounges, you'll see a lot of females smoking cigars. When I do events or appearances and stuff, a lot of the women come. They smoking cigars and they know what they're doing. They're not just faking it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's not for everybody you know it, if you, it's like kind of eating game food or if you're not a drinker you want to appreciate appreciate a good scotch or a wine right. you're gonna have it's an acquired taste okay. uh, what are the common misconceptions about cigars if there are any do you have a it's kind of like cigarettes right you know uh, cigarettes are dumped with like hazardous hazardous you know contaminants and poisons and tobacco is just tobacco it's just grown 
peeled, aged, and put together. Uh, I wouldn't recommend you smoking every day. But right. To have a hobby instead of a habit, it's totally not like a cigarette. Yeah, uh, because um, cigarettes are actually more regulated than they used to be. So, I mean, is it the same thing for cigars? Like it's getting regulated. It's a big problem now for um, for smoke. There's a thing called Smokers' Rights of America. Uh-huh. And cigar smokers, I should say. And what they're trying to do is regulate it like cigarettes and to try to get a, a company to blend a certain way mm. would t- totally take the art and, and actually everything away from tobacco and cigar making. Right. So it would destroy the industry if they try to regulate it that way of how, what, how much tobacco goes uh, in comparison to another to give it that mixed feel, that taste. It'll destroy, you know, everything. But, you know, it, it it's almost there. We'll see what happens. Do you yeah. guys, do you guys like, ever talk about a, other cigar people get around and talk about maybe something to try to prevent something like that from happening, just to, in terms of keeping the art? Like there the there are groups that get together. Um, I mean, I don't like to say, I stay away from a lot of, a lot of different cigar companies and stuff right. because I did a show once, and, and the it's kind of like an artist... I don't like to get other people's ideas into my head. Mm-hmm. I don't like to go to trade shows or, or mix with other people's ideas. I like to stay my own person because, God forbid, I do something and maybe somebody did say something that I came into. I like to create my own ideas and not go with trends. Right. A lot of cigar companies, they follow trends with advertisement, with taste, with labels. You know. So I just try to do my own thing. But there are groups that are getting together to go to the Senate and you know, to put a halt on all these regulations, okay. taxes, and what have you. So you pay, you try to stay out of the politics of everything. It's more just you yeah. Just do it for the I, love I of do the, my own thing, right? You know, I have my own. I have a fan base. You know, I don't have to really go to trade shows, and I don't blame people for doing that. It's just not my cup of tea. Selling Cubans are, you know, illegal in the United States. Does that ever yeah. like affect business or anything? Yeah, I don't make Cuban. Cig- I don't make Cuban cigars. Right. So it don't affect me. Right. And do you ever get any like backlash from people that you own like cigar shops like oh my god he's selling cigars? Well, when I do my charities like I do a cancer charity, people go how could you do a cancer charity when you do when you own a cigar business? Um, not backlash, just kind of a, a question I get. I could understand where they're coming from. Um, a lot of misconceptions again with cigar. You got to really be into cigars to know why you would like it or why you would dislike it. So I don't let I don't really get involved with the. Uh, trying to argue with people about that okay and last question if you could ever relax and enjoy a cigar with anybody and like you know sit back and relax and kick it you have anybody who'd be past or present um in 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 the fantasy world Fan- anybody groucho marx groucho marx yeah groucho marx from the 1920s <laughs> head of his time very uh big inspiration in my life you know comedic uh, humo- humongous comedic inspiration in my life and um, he's just a, a magnificent cigar, uh, you know, icon. So, yeah, maybe him. Groucho Marx, everybody. Remember that name. We're going to take a brief break. When we come back, we're going to roll one right on camera for you guys. How you doing? Hi. Hi. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks. If only child abuse were this easy to recognize. If you even suspect abuse, call 1-800-4-A-CHILD. All calls are anonymous and confidential. Trust your instincts. Welcome back. Paulie, how you doing, sir? Hey, how are you, my friend? I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? Good. I want to thank you for bringing the guest here so he can roll one up for us on camera. Fantastic. Appreciate it. So, um, what's his name? His name is Melvin Lopez. He's been doing this for about 20 years of his life. He comes from a couple of the greatest factories in Santo Domingo. Uh, Davido, Fuente, La Flor Dominicana. And if you're in the cigar industry, you would know those names. Mm-hmm. And now he works for the Yankees, Paulie Cigars, the best in the business. Really? La Casa Grande. All right. And what he's doing is right now the outer wrap, which is the final leaf. Before he does that, we have a process where we take four different tobaccos. Mm-hmm. One is in Spanish. It's called Ligero, which is very strong and, and full of flavor. There's another tobacco called Seco, which is very mild. Mm-hmm. And depending if you want the cigar to be a full-flavored cigar or a mild cigar, creamy cigar, 
you mix those ingredients accordingly. And what he, we do is press them for about two hours at the factory. And we do events such as these at weddings, parties, or golf outings, or whatever. He'll take that final process right in front of, you know, in, before the guest eyes. Mm. And what we do is called wrapping the cigar, which is a leaf. That one's made in here in the United States, Connecticut leaf, Connecticut shade wrapper. Mm. Um, it's one of the best wrappers in the world. And just to do that, it, it takes about 10 years just to learn how to perfect that. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna, just going to ask that. Is it something that can be learned easily, or does it take time to learn nah, how to do No, you need time this? to learn it. I mean, I'm sure anybody has their own learning curve. Uh -huh. he's, a ra he's, he's one of my younger um, rollers, mm -hmm. but he's probably the best one I have. So it's what you can learn at a certain, um, you know, your learning curve. Right. What's the, so what is the uh, the age gap between everybody in terms of the rollers that you have? Yeah, he's the youngest. Uh, mostly they're in their 50s. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's in his 50s. He was a new jack three years ago, and we gave him a chance, and he rose to the top. Yep, you know. Know. Just like the Yankees. Yeah, <laughs> just like the Yankees. So have you um, guys ever thought about expanding business, maybe going out from out of the Bronx? Maybe I don't have to. I mean, I just blew up all over the world. We have an internet business. People shop from all over the world, all over the country. You know, the internet show is doing big. Light em Up Friday cigar show. Catch it on YouTube. Um, and the website's just where everybody shops. You know, in the factories in the Bronx, mm -hmm. literally in Arthur Avenue. People come from all over the world to come see that. Um, and we're like one of the 10 top destinations of things to visit when you come to New York. Mm. So people bus in and they see it. So I, I have my following that way. Um, as far as getting in other stores, we do that. We, we wholesale to other shops and they'll buy from us in bulk and sell them in their own cigar shops. Okay, okay. That's good. So as far, um, as far as the catering, the parties, how does that work? How will people get um Somebody will call us and we send your own tobacco cigar rollers. So say you're having a wedding, you want to really impress your guests. Right. Or a movie premiere or something like that. We'll send a, a couple, an attendant and a roller. Um, female or male attendants interact with your guests, eloquently say what's going on. What I just explained to you, mm -hmm. they'll explain to your guests. Cut the cigar, maybe light them or put them in a bag for later. Maybe label them with the personalized labels of maybe the bride and groom's name. Mm -hmm. um, what celebrity that party belongs to that night. Um, and that's and that's basically what we do. Okay, so how will we get in contact with you? What's the contact information? I miss the Twitter, man. To Paulie, at Paulie Cigars uh, and um, at Lacoste LCG Cigar Company, at, uh, Facebook, Paulie Cigars, and LCGcigars.com. Okay. You get in touch as well. 8557 Cigars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, spe speaking of the cigars, you want to tell us, how did you get the name Cigar Czar, by the way? Is that something that you came up with yourself? No, or? nobody, if you name yourself something like <laughs> that, that means you, you ain't that, you know what I mean? But if, if you know, that's something that came that you must have read on the internet, because yes. I know I didn't <laughs> But just like Polish Cigars, you can't give yourself a nickname. One is always given to you. Given to you. Um, you know, I don't think there's somebody in New York who sells more cigars than I do. On my brag, it's just the case, it's the fact, you know, I have seven of these guys rolling hundreds of cigars daily. Right. So we're a factory. We're not a lounge. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's what we do. Well, how do I get the name Poly Cigars? Mm -hmm. In my neighborhood, everybody's got a, a nickname. So right. cigars is not a bad one to have. All right, Paulie, man. Thank you. I want to appreciate you for coming here tonight, man. Thanks we appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you soon in another episode of the Bronx Journal.